ကျွန်တော်လေးတဲ့လေးလမ်းမှာကိုညာတကုတ်ဝင်ပြီးတော့ကျွန်တော်ရှာဝီစစ်စီးပါရင်ပြာတောင်းကိုပြန်တည်
uh, uh, organizations. So when I was reporting this kind of issues, like um, my native people in my southern part of the states, you know, said that or oh, this reporters uh, from Rakai State reporting um, about the very uh, sens- sensational and very sensitive uh, issue like. Uh, Muslims and uh, Rohingya and the Rakhine stuffs because it's really, really uh, sensitive for my own people in my in my in my state because you know you cannot talk about Muslims people uh, 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 you cannot talk about the Christianity you cannot talk about the other uh, religious and uh, uh, ethnic stuffs uh, too much before two thousand twelve so I started marrying career on two thousand ten so bef- in two thousand uh, there are uh, 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 religious tensions uh, between Muslims and Buddhist communities in Rakhine State. Like from 2012, that uh, tensions started to grow uh, across the country, like in Metila, uh, uh, Nijina, Yangon, and other big cities. Uh, so I would say the tensions between the uh, 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 religious organizations, religious communities started from Rakhine in 2012. Uh, so before the 2012, like there were so much stories uh, between the uh, Muslims and Rakhines and uh, uh, like it, 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 even in 18th century and like a lot of uh, 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 some Bama Rakhine invaded, uh, uh, you know, Bama kings invaded Rakhine state. So this kind of tensions rooted in the uh, community. Uh, but in 2012, is the, the, it, the, it was the biggest and uh, most, um, how can I say, it's really uh, uh, tense years uh, for the whole country because, you know, uh, one Rakhine uh, girl, he was raped uh, and, uh, uh, and killed and murdered by the uh, three Muslims, uh, young uh, young Muslims there. So from that news, that news, uh, uh, you know, sparked uh, the whole country. So from that moment, like the religious tensions go, you know, went on and on t- across the country. So I, I'm from that state, so I know how people think. Uh, on the news of, uh, you know, related with the Muslims, related with, related with Rakhine and some other uh, uh, stuffs. So, you know, I was growing in that kind of community, uh, you know, since I was born. So um, I moved to uh, Rakhine in 2005 because, you know, uh, if you want to uh, learn further studies of like higher edu- education, we have no uh, uh, proper uh, 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 education in my state. So it, you have two options to go to Yangon, the capital of the country, or the, uh, the Sitwe, the capital city of, uh, of the state, uh, Rakai state. So there's two ways. So Sitwe, uh, the capital city, Sitwe, is uh, kind of a remote uh, uh, the capital, uh, but it's, the, it's, it's considered uh, the most developed uh, city a town uh, uh, in the whole state. But, you know, most of the Rakhine young people, they just moved to Yangon for the further studies uh, or to earn more money uh, 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 by working um, like other uh, gold trading and other trading stuff. Because, you know, uh, the whole state is uh, kind of uh, was separated uh, by the mountain range uh, with the Bama majority uh, uh, territory. So the whole state is kind of isolated from the um, major uh, part uh, of the country. So if you're like, uh, you know, when I, uh, I moved uh, uh, to Yangon, you know, some someone asked me, where are you from? And then I, I, I said, I, I'm, I'm from Rakhine. And then they told me, where is it? You know, uh, why, uh, you know, uh, aren't you talking the Rakhine? I, I essence, you know, you are you are you are speaking the Bama like uh, essence because you know southern part of the Rakhine state speaking more like Bama majority like essence. Uh, so you know, some of the people uh, in Yangon and other big cities they don't really distinguish between the southern Rakhine and northern Rakhine and other uh, uh, um, areas too. Like if you come from Kitchen State, you know, 
some people in Yangon will ask you, where are you from? And then someone uh, uh, will answer that, you know, I'm from Kachin. Oh, Kachins are like you? Like this kind of weird and awkward question that they always ask. You know, uh, many ethnic people experience that kind of awkward moment in their, uh, in their life. Uh, so, you know, I moved to Yangon in 2005. So, and then I attended Dagon University from 2005 to 2009. So uh, uh, English specialization. So after that, most of the uh, young people, uh, uh, like including me, we didn't have any idea where to uh, 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 go, you know, for the another uh, like vacational uh, uh, schools or training. We, we, we had no idea because, you know, before 2010, it was like everything is uh, uh, dark, you know, uh, you, 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 you don't have any uh, uh, future, uh, you know, uh, clear path uh, to, to move on. Yeah. So, yeah. So, so when I, I graduated in 2009, you know, I had no idea uh, what to do next. So, so, but, you know, there's no, there was no political activities in the school, university, you know, we can compare the situation before the coup around uh, 2015, 2016, because, you know, uh, before 2010, like uh, in my university life, there are no students' unions, there are no, uh, like, we, we could see some other football team or some other, like, uh, reading club, that's all, but no more political uh, activities. But after 2010 and 2011, 12, like, more and more, like some students, young students, they uh, tried uh, to reform the student unions. They t- tried to uh, reestablish the former legion, uh, 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 you know, students' unions in Yangon University and other university too. So, you know, I was like uh, uh, growing up in a <laughs> dark uh, uh, age. So, yeah, so... Yeah, I, I then I joined uh, the some philanthropic uh, groups, like some Korean-funded organizations and some organizations related with the U.S. aid organizations. So they give uh, some small grants and funds uh, um, to the small uh, civil society organizations in Yangon and other remote areas. So I joined one philanthropic groups there. So I I had some other friends uh, uh, there. And then uh, one of my friends uh, told me to uh, uh, to get an interview um, at the newspaper, uh, which is you know the uh, uh, newly formed a uh, newspaper uh, to 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 publish a newspaper uh, with the funding of um, a political party, ethnic political party. So I joined them after I done one year of philanthropic uh, works. Uh, there, you know, I became a journalist. <laughs> Mm, right. That's quite a story bringing you to what your current profession is and, uh, and, and coming from a, a more, uh, coming from a place outside of the capital and then it, it being an ethnic minority and settling in and talking about what it was like to integrate into, uh, into the city. So from the time that you moved to Yangon, have you basically settled and remained in the capital or have you, uh, have you lived and traveled in different parts of the country? It's like, you know, it's, it's, it's not like here in Spain, you know, if you are living in Galicia or Valencia or Barcelona or some other uh, southern or northern part of the country, you can easily move to uh, Madrid, the capital of the country. It's really easy for, for the people, like, uh, uh, for your information. Like, or if you are living in Texas or other West Coast, and you, you, you can, you know, uh, uh, go to New York very easily. But in my country, it's not like that. Because, you know, in my, in my country, like, if you want to go to Yangon when you are living in a very remote uh, 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 area of the country, it's really expensive for, like, to, to, for, for the bus or for the uh, 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 highway express uh, or the flight. You know, before 2010, like, most of the, like, 95%, I would say, 95% of the people in ethnic uh, states and regions, uh, uh, you know, they couldn't afford uh, uh, to uh, get a flight from, the, from, from their state and regions to go to uh, Yangon, the capital. 
they, they couldn't uh, afford it. So, you know, uh, if you can uh, get some something like some uh, uh, gifts or some, you know, if you even if you could watch a movie in the capital uh, uh, Yangon in Myanmar. You know, it would be a biggest story if you uh, come back to your uh, uh, natives. You know, it's it's really a good story. Uh, a story like for an example, I grown up with the uh, uh, like a second graded uh, P two PlayStation two uh, uh, game matching. But you know, when I was uh, uh, like playing the PlayStation 2 in my hometown. Like it, we thought that this is the biggest, uh, latest technology for us. But at the time in Yangon, everybody is playing the PlayStation 4. So this is a this is a very big difference uh, for the young people in Yangon and other area of the country. It's big difference. So you cannot watch uh, the uh, uh, Batman, the latest Batman movie, and when you live in the Rakhine kind or of Kachin or uh, or chin, so it's really difficult to to get in. So every manga books, like co- comic books, or uh, when you when you were reading when you were re- young, it's really outdated, like five years or ten years outdated uh, uh, than in the uh, the latest one in Yangon. So <laughs> this is this is a very big difference. So when I I came to Yangon, so I had to uh, you know follow the trends and follow the environment of the uh, uh, culture and everything I I, 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 I tried uh, you know uh, uh, the best I, I try uh, to follow all those kinds of cultures you know not not only me all the ethnic boys and girls who came to Yangon for further study they they, they they had to try like me too you know to even to adapt the environment this is this is very big difference for all of the ethnic people in my country so yeah so after that yeah yeah go on so you're you're talking about something of like a culture shock coming from not just uh coming from like the countryside to the big city but even even more so coming from from a different culture of living in Rakhine communities as you mentioned and and other people that would be coming from Chen or Kachin or Karen communities into a not just a, a, a country to an urban environment, but also a culture shock of of, uh, of of the dominant ethnicity that you're now living in. Can you give any? And you mentioned how you also have to adjust to that in some ways and learn how to integrate into a new kind of environment, with, which is culture shock. So, can you give any examples of? what that transition was like, like things that you had to overcome or learn or integrate or adapt that was, uh, that, that would give an indication of what it was like to have to settle into this new culture. Uh, I think I was a, a little bit of, uh, uh, I was lucky because, you know, when, uh, before I came to Yangon, I read a lot. I mean, uh, a lot, a lot, because uh, I decided in my hometown that uh, I, I found some kind of motivational books that say, you know, you you, you have to read uh, if you go to a big cities. You know, you should you should have more uh, knowledge. Uh, you know, uh, because you know you have to deal with the uh, wolves <laughs> uh, in a big city. So I read a lot, and uh, you know, I even decided to read every single books in my hometown so i did it so you know the 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 final destination for me in my hometown to read the whole library uh the biggest library in my hometown so i didn't finish it but you know i did read every like single books apart from the library the 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 township library so that actually uh uh uh, fills me like uh, some kind of uh knowledge uh to survive in the big cities uh, so because you know, uh, a lot of people in my uh, country, and uh, before two thousand, I would say two thousand uh, uh, ten, like a, a, a lot of uh, young people, they uh, they read a lot. Like uh, uh, like for the people like me who came from that ethnic area of the country, they had they read a lot. So that kind of uh, 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 action actually affects to the 
ethnic people. Because, you know, uh, most of the success story, like Udang and uh, uh, the Secretary General at and United Nations, uh, uh, and, you know, he's the first uh, uh, Bami citizen, uh, 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 you know, in the United Nations. So uh, that kind of story is motivated a lot of young people in my countries. So Udang is not from Yangon. So he's from you know, the remote area of the country. So most of the people think that if you are going to be a kind of going to struggle or to survive, if you want to survive in the big cities, you have to read. And then, you know, uh, and then it's not really important. Uh, it's, uh, f- from, you know, it's not really important that where, where are you from like that. So, you know, when, when I was young, I read a lot. I, I read a lot and a lot, like uh, 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 every like uh, 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 magazines, uh, novels, uh, books, like every kind of books. That really motivated me actually, and then uh, I still believe that the reading books, um, uh, you know, uh, that changed uh, me a lot. Yeah. So you said that in your early journalistic career, you were writing about some of the realities of the different religions and ethnicities, especially in Rakhine State and how they interacted towards each other and some of the reality of that situation. And you got a lot of pushback and criticism. What, what exactly were you writing to describe the relations between these different peoples and what kind of pushback did you receive? So, you know, as I, as I said earlier, like uh, the religious problems and issues uh, before 2012, um, uh, those issues were never mentioned in uh, like mainstream medias or novels or, you know, you cannot read this kind of stuff in, in, like anywhere. You cannot you cannot fight it this this kind of issues because you know it was burned by the uh, uh, government like uh, before 2010 it's the military government but you know most of most of uh, uh, the young people didn't realize that we lived in uh, under the military government but after 2010 most of the people they just realized that you know we have to change something um, so um, before that as I said most of the people they if they want to uh, uh, read like kind of a novels, which uh, 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 like which uh, which is a novel uh, written of uh, Muslims girls and the Buddhist uh, boy who are in relationship, and then you know uh, their 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 parents didn't recognize them as a a couple. This kind of stuff, you know. And personally, I I really wanted to write this kind of novels, you know, the Muslims, or girl and Buddhist boy, how their relationship go on with the kind of back, their background, a parent's background, or culture, and this kind of stuff. But until now, you cannot uh, find this kind of uh, uh, novels or articles. You cannot, you cannot read it in, anywhere. Uh, so after 2012, this is the, you know, after the uh, uh, religious uh, tensions in Rakhine, that changed the perspectives of the, the whole country a lot. Because, you know, in 2012 and 2014 and 2015, there, there were a lot of religious tensions and uh, unrest and uh, crisis, religious crisis uh, in the whole country. So after that, most of the people started to talk uh, about the religious tensions between the uh, communities. Like nobody's uh, really talked about the Hinduism uh, or like uh, Christians, uh, uh, Christianity before t- 2012. So, because you know, I would say some somehow the uh, crisis, religious crisis, and tensions in 2012 changed the country a lot. Because you know, I personally witnessed uh, like many events between the Rakhine and Buddhists, and the Buddhists uh, 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 and the Buddhists, bet- even in the Buddhist communities, like in Maitila, uh, some uh, uh, ultra nationalist people killed the normal civilian, this kind of stuff in 2012 and 2014. So when I was studying my, uh, uh, when I started my career in 2010, like it's just um, uh, uh, a year 
uh, that Dong Sanjuji has been re- uh, she was released from the prison and a lot of things going on. And then the new government, like Kwasi government, uh, Utte Insane. So he he is uh, like half uh, half of his government is appointed by the military and half of them are like pretended like a civilian government. But the uh, bright side of uh, Utte Insane government is he reformed a lot. Like uh, uh, you know. Uh, Obama, uh, Barack Obama came to the uh, uh, country, and then a lot of many uh, uh, international stories. Like you know, you can read on uh, about my country on Washington Post, CNN, New York Times, almost every week. Uh, and then a lot of international uh, foreign investment came in, and after 2010 uh, election. So this is the like golden year, uh, you know. And then to, I, I think. Um, uh, Utensin government can handle somehow the religious tension between 2012 and 2014. But the latest story after 2015 is an, another story. But, uh, uh, you know, in 2000, uh, between 2010 to 2015, like uh, 2014 to 2015, we journalists always uh, 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 remember this, ca- this year between 2014 and 15 as the golden year of the journalism, because you know you can you can write everything you want, but some yeah you know in, between 2014 and 15, like uh, and then like um, uh, in 2011, like most of the exile medias uh, which left. And to, uh, uh, which is uh, most of the exam media, which were established in, after 1980 uprising. So uh, they left the country, like most of the students, they left the country and formed a new uh, media agency in Delhi, uh, Chiang Mai, in Thailand. Like some people are in, uh, uh, in Singapore and some people are in Norway, like that. So in 2000, after 2011, they, they just came back to the country uh, and then they started their uh, uh, news organizations in the country. So it's it's like, uh, you know, uh, many young people, including me, we uh, uh, started to apply, you know, to, to apply the journalism. And then, you know, you can even uh, uh, get a job at any uh, uh, news media because, you know, and then... T- um, if you are a, a experienced journalist, like if you have three years of a journalism and a small media, you know you can get like four hundred dollars or three hundred dollars per month. It is this is a very uh, uh, you know uh, it's a golden time for the journalism industry, and then we always remember that time. Uh, but you know after two thousand and fifteen, it changed a lot. So. Before 2015, every, everyone's idea, every journalist's idea is, you know, after 2015, uh, we expected that, you know, we have that kind of sources and uh, kind of sources that uh, sources f- inside the um, president's house or sources inside the ruling parties or sources inside the uh, uh, um, uh, military, that kind of sources we always uh, um uh, writing in our news story. So, but, you know, some of the stories we cannot uh, write, we cannot mention their names of the sources, but uh, we know that most of the story, if one uh, newspaper always mentions uh, their sources, at sources inside the military or sources inside the presidents, this kind of thing that someone uh, is using that newspaper from the government or from the military, that kind of mindset we had. But uh, we expected that that kind of sources will be banished or will be <laughs> disappeared um, after 2015. Because, you know, in 2015, uh, w- most of the people believe that Dong San Suji would win the election landslide. And because, you know, we, are, uh, we were sick of the military and the, you know, the uh, quasi uh, uh, government. So we were sick. The whole country is sick of them. So uh, most of the people expected a lot uh, from the National League for Democracy, NAD Party, and from Dong San Suji too. So, you know, there are too much expectations from Dong San Suji and uh, uh, and, uh, her party, NLD. Yeah. 
Mm, so you mentioned how the early 2010s was this golden years of, of journalism. And you were, of course, a journalist during that time, taking advantage of those freedoms and the ability to write and think and travel to a greater extent than ever before. Going back a few years and looking at your entry into the journalism field, which I believe was 2010, uh, can you share why you wanted to become a journalist? What, as your career was developing, as you were going through school and looking at your your life ahead, why did you choose journalism as the field that you wanted to go into? Um, honestly, you know, I didn't have any idea to be a journalist or writer so whatsoever. But, you know, as I said before, like uh, when you, you know, uh, when someone is studying uh, like English specialization or economics or uh, uh, like uh, the Myanmar uh, uh, major or anthropology or whatever you you know you, you study, it's really uh, uh, doesn't affect to your career in my country. And then you know whatever you take, like uh, if you are even when you if you finish or if you graduate with medicine, like s- some of the uh, doctors they change their career to the uh, writers that kind of stuff. So I finished, I graduated with English specialization, but, you know, I had no idea where, where, where to go. So, uh, you know, accidentally, um, uh, one of my friends told me to and to get an interview at the newspaper and then um, I became a journalist. Uh, but, you know, personally, you know, uh, as I said, I read a lot and then I more interested, I was more interested in uh, politics and religious stuff. So, uh you know, in the newspaper where uh, I worked um, uh, in 2010, as they their uh, background fund, um, like uh, how can I say, ownership, their their ownership of the newspaper's um, uh, ethnic political party. So White Tiger, we call it White Tiger Party. Uh, so uh, and Bami's, we call it Japu Party. So there, they you know, uh, in 2010, a lot of political parties uh, they formed. Uh, many uh, newspapers with their own money. So they wanted to influence the uh, audience um, with the editorial um, influence. Uh, so in 2010, uh, with my editors and newsrooms, we agreed that not to be influenced by the political parties, the ownership. Uh, but later, after three months, like the political party, they tried uh, to influence the newsrooms. Like th- that's not only us. Like some other political parties, they formed and they 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 they, they gave uh, monies to form a uh, uh, the newspapers like uh, uh, NAD two, the ruling party, and then another opposition party after two thousand fifteen, the uh, USDP Union Solidarity Party. They also formed a newspaper too. So. Commercially, I mean, not uh, uh, like uh, like a journalistic uh, newspaper you cannot find, but they uh, declare that we were we will go as a uh, you know with the journalism standards like um, the D line is D line um, is the NLD uh, mouthpiece, and then uh, the union uh, that that is the USDB mouthpiece. So you know we had this kind of uh, propaganda. Um, uh, uh, newspapers. So the one that the newspaper I worked is also was a, also a kind of propaganda. But we I didn't realize that uh, you know uh, at first. But after three months, they started to uh, influence the newsrooms and editorial policy. So you know I, I personally say you know uh, fuck you. <laughs> I mean uh, literally, <laughs> I, I I told them. Uh, and then you know I even uh, kicked the uh, tables at the newsroom, <laughs> uh, uh, the, the newsroom uh, uh, in, in in the newsrooms, and then you know I quit. So uh, because you know at the time almost uh, uh, like m- most influenced and um, uh, 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 you know wealthy political bodies, you know they they form a, a newspaper, they, they they bought a newspaper kind of things. So. Um, a bit after 2010 uh, and then to the uh till to 
2012, you know, I, I worked at the uh, Mizima Media Group. That's, that's, um, that is one of the biggest mainstream media right now. So Mizima was uh, once an exile media. They formed a new daily and then they have their own office in Chiang Mai. So after 2000, uh, uh, 10, uh, new government. And then, uh, in 2011, the ministry of, uh, the information announced that, you know, all the medias who, uh, uh, um, uh, are in, who are, uh, who were exiled, uh, uh, before 2010 can come back to the country like that. So, you know, uh, the Mizima media is one of them. So I worked with them to, to 2012. So, you know, in 2012, like, uh, uh, like we have our own, how can I say it's a contribution fee. So like, uh, if you can earn, like uh, two thousand chats, like uh, two thousand right now, one one dollar, uh, and uh, th- this time. So if you can earn one dollar at the time, uh, in in one day, so it you know you you are superstar journalist at the time in two thousand twelve. So if you can write like uh, uh, two or three stories in your uh, in your newspaper, like uh, so you can get like three or four dollars uh, per day. So you are you know. You were a super rich journalist at the mm-hmm. time. <laughs> wow! So, so you know, like all the reporters, they they are they they are chasing the every like a fire broke of stories and then the flood stories, weather stories. You know, like you can see every reporters and every events and uh, uh, moments and accidents everywhere. Uh, and then you know. Uh, uh, that, that's why I, I I told you that's this is the uh, honeymoon and golden uh, uh, year of the journalism. Uh, uh, you know, I uh, I personally uh, developed my I I how can I say career uh, uh, from 2012 to 2015. So um, so I was promoted to a editor, a sub editor, and editor in in Mizima. Uh, so I did a lot of uh, crime stories there. But the interesting thing is, uh, before 2015, I experienced a lot of government uh, 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 technique that they, uh, uh, they've done to, before 2015 is the land grabbing stories. So if you can check uh, the history uh, 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 events between 2010 and 2015, there were a lot of new stories about land grabbing. So before uh, 2010, like after t- uh, 1988, a lot of uh, uh, military they uh, they they seized the, the lands and like across the country. So they owned like many important and crowded areas uh, um, uh, of the public area. Uh, the military owns it. Uh, so, you know, they occupy it. Like in Rakhine State, like uh, the most beautiful place in Rakhine State is Napoli Beach. So <clears throat> some of the people can uh, uh, might know that place. The most beautiful, like uh, before 1980, the most beautiful uh, uh, beach in the world, Napoli Beach. So the whole show in Napoli Beach uh, um, is owned by the military. So not only in Napoli, like and uh, and and then uh, in this uh, eastern part of the country, we we have the one township called Jiangdong. So uh, British call that city as Kingdong. So in that city, the most beautiful places and areas are owned by the military until now, and and in Shan State too, and uh, in Mongyua and other in Mandalay. It's like you know, in Mandalay, it's obviously uh, 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 the palace. The, 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 the palace, it's uh, in the center of the a town. It's owned by the military. So you can imagine that. So after 2010, a lot of people across the country, they uh, reclaimed uh, um, their uh, ownership uh, of their land before, uh, you know, 2010, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, which, which were uh, seized by the military occupied by the military. So the Udaisen government, they try a lot to give uh, this kind of lens to the uh, 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 original owner. Uh, so people uh, like the uh, uh, Udaisen a lot because, you know, they have their own uh, own lands back uh, that their ancestor, you know, uh, lost uh, in 2010. 
Uh, and then a lot of uh, uh, stories on going on between like 2012, 2013. You know, you can see every uh, uh, protest uh, 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 on the streets in Yangon and Mandalay that all, all like uh, uh, 90% of the protests are about land grabbing. But, you know, what the, uh, 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 what the media and newspaper could do at the time is like if you run a story on the front page or the second page or the third page, uh, one land grabbing story is like, you know, uh, 10 or 20 people from uh, a small village near Yangon protested in the downtown uh, about the land grabbing uh, uh, like 20 years ago. Uh, and then you, you will run that you will run uh, that story on the front page. So after maybe two or three days, uh, the uh, uh, state uh, I, the sponsor state back newspaper announced that um, we gave them back this this kind of thing. So people really believe in the newspaper that oh you know if you protested and if if you protest or if you uh, 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 reclaim your um, uh, ownership uh, on the streets, you know you can easily get it back. So you know there were a lot of stories like like fake fake, fake stories uh, and and then scam like some some reporters uh, like. I witnessed that kind of stories that some reporters uh, in uh, Shan State and Mandalay they even uh, organized uh, people, fake people, uh, uh, and and then they they organized the people who didn't who don't actually lost their lands, and then they pretended that they lost their lands before 2010, and then it, the reporters organized the protest on the streets, and then they ran a story uh, on, the, uh, on the newspaper and the uh, uh, television. So after three days, you know, the the government gave them back this kind of, of scam and fake story. I even witnessed that. So so you know the the newspapers uh, and media, the you know. They were really powerful at the time. So most of the people, they are really eager uh, uh, to read the newspaper in the morning. You know, we have like more than 100 uh, 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 newspapers, including uh, uh, John, weekly journals at the time. So you can imagine that uh, we have like, uh, 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 like f- in, in, in the uh, uh, big cities, like we have 5 million people in Yangon, like uh, uh, one or two millions in Mandalay, like, but like almost everyone like who can read, uh, uh, they are, you know, really eager to wake up in the morning to read newspapers. You know what yeah. that, that newspaper says, you know, which media will say something, this kind of thing. Yeah, mm, that's yeah, yeah, yeah. That that's interesting, and it reminds me of reading um, about the colonial experience in Myanmar. That there's a statistic that when uh, when England when England first took over uh, Myanmar as Burma at that time as a colonial as a colony, that the literacy rate in Myanmar was considered to be higher than that in England itself. And the I think this this is just a, a testimonial of um, the, the the love of reading and the love of learning that you see both now and when when the censor the state censor resigned his position and there there was greater freedom as well as historically and how just that that hunger and that eagerness to want to read and to want to learn um, I have a question though about the looking at the nature of journalism and I think it's so interesting when the the state censor resigned his position and then there there was just an, an opening and a flourishing and freedom of speech and expression that was able to happen that 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 couldn't happen prior to that and looking at journalism specifically you know it's interesting because you talk about the ties of journalism to politics and to parties and the influence of those organizations, whether they're ethnic organizations, whether they're seemingly democratic organizations like the NLD or whether they're the military or USDP, the political party of the military, that all of them are, from the way you describe it sounds like, are, are trying to control or manipulate media in some kind of way that's favorable to them, which in a democratic society is uh, they're, 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 they're in- encouraged to be more of a separation than these than a control or manipulation. But perhaps uh, this is uh, the, 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 the system being what it's been for the last number of decades and generations, this has been slow to move. On the other hand, I- I've also heard 
heard that there's for for those that are getting for those journalists that are wanting to get into the field that there's long been a a kind of intersection between activism and journalism and that some uh, some people who have cared a lot about certain issues and wanting wanted to be activists has, have seen journalism as a way that they can combine with their activism, which is, I think, in a Western sense, is also somewhat problematic. We we see uh, in in the West we see a more distinct separation between what we like to call objective journalism, and in my opinion, there, there there's no such thing as purely objective. We have to look at you know where the bias is, where the uh, e- even if that bias is not known. And we have to identify it and talk about it because none of us are completely objective creatures or, or platforms. Uh, however, there is an intention to want to, to to be able to identify that bias and separate that out, so that when you look at the goals of political parties, governments, militaries, ethnic groups or organizations, or even progressive activist causes, that there there is a way to uh, to try to carve out an independent journalistic space where. Uh, the, these these two uh, objectives are not being combined, and and, and one can look at uh, one can have a, a more intended objective journalistic experience with reporting on issues of uh, ethnic interests or, or government or, um, or or even activist causes, but that they're not one and the same. So I wonder what your thoughts are of, uh, especially of this golden period and of this opening up in journalism did, uh, and, and perhaps concerns you had of where there was intention to try to combine different things in the name of journalism in order to promote oneself or one's cause, or where there there was a, a real attempt to try to create a more objective structure of what the journalism was was supposed to be or or trying to carve out. Oh yeah, <laughs> this is quite a very complex uh, uh, scenario in my country because you know, uh, like I always, uh, uh, I used to uh, give an example of uh, the uh, political situation in my country uh, the, uh, during the after two thousand ten because you know, uh, in in my rural area and remote area of the country, a lot of people like uh, after two thousand twelve, many people can uh, could use uh, could buy. Uh, uh, a SIM card with uh, uh, 1,500, like one dollars uh, uh, right now. So th- they can they can open a, a Facebook account uh, uh, like that after 2012. So so many people they don't really uh, they didn't have. Uh, uh, they didn't. Uh, they cannot. They, they they couldn't afford to buy the Nokia uh, 3310 model before 2012. So it's like it's like a boom. Uh, for everyone, like like one like one person of the uh, uh, population, they uh, had watched the uh, uh, they could afford to buy a uh, uh, colorful TV uh, before uh, 2010, like that. So in, in in my native village, like we uh, we have 350 uh, uh, households in my village, but we only have one. Uh, television. So, if you want to go to, if you want to watch a movie or or, or televisions or state news, you have to go to a, a you know a certain a, a, a house uh, you know in the center of the village. So you can watch uh, uh, news there. So that's kind of thing. But after two thousand twelve, like everything was bombed, and then like almost everyone's uh, like you know uh, 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 you know uh, immediately. Uh, on the some kind of uh, another level of the technology. So in the uh, media industry, uh, that also happened too. Because, you know, most of the uh, news before 2010s are more like business news, like uh, some uh, uh, price of the X uh, were increased or some uh, uh, price of the uh, sweater or uh, clothes were decreased. That kind of news we uh, had to uh, read before 2010. But after 2010, uh, like in even 2014, after uh, I personally uh, uh, involved in a protest uh, to uh, reopen uh, two newspapers which were uh, banned by the censorship board in 2000, 2014. So in 2014, uh, 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 me and other 
I think uh, 120 uh, journalists and other uh, layout designers and photographers, we protested uh, to reopen the two newspapers in 2014. So at the time, uh, after we protest, after our protest, the uh, the, the government, they um, abolish uh, the censorship board in 2014. So, you know, you can see the result that, uh, uh, you know, after your protest, that that censorship board was uh, abolished and removed uh, uh, the, from the department. So this is a kind of a, a achievement for the for the journalism uh, industry. Um, but you know, after two thousand uh, 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 fifteen, like uh, as you said, a lot of uh, st- students from the students' union they moved into a journalism industry, and then. At that moment, like uh, everyone's talking about the journalism, everyone's talking about the activism. Uh, that that time, yes, it's really mixed up. Uh, and then, uh, like we can uh, divide into three uh, categories. One is by the uh, uh, political parties, uh, influence newspapers, and another one is the. Uh, business, uh, commercial newspapers, and another one is like really, as you said, like a subjected <laughs> newspapers at the time. So so with the political uh, uh, parties, influenced newspapers at the time, so they they wanted to go both way with the commercial and the political. So, you know, they aimed, actually they aimed uh, to the 2015 election. So most of the political uh, parties uh, uh, which uh, formed a newspaper before 2015 uh, were, their they, they, they aim is to influence the people uh, 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 in 2015 general election. So that's why uh, they, 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 they established a lot of newspapers and online media before 2015. <clears throat> so at the time, other like students' unions and then other uh, uh, more activist-like uh, newspapers also emerged th- at the time. But after 2015 general election, those newspapers uh, and those kind of uh, activist-like uh, uh, journalists were gone. Uh, they disappeared uh, after 2015. It's really interesting. Yeah. Mm, right. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for that explanation. Um, I want to move to looking at uh, the Rohingya issue. This is something that, as you referenced in the very start of the conversation, this is a crisis that is from the region where you're from, and so you have an up close and personal relationship to it. And you were also, as I understand, one of the first reporters to start to uh, report on the issue and write about it, and and actually be on the front lines and follow what was going on that issue is is so important in and of itself also in understanding the current crisis and coup and so i think your understanding and research of it at the ground level from an early date can be insightful for listeners to 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 hear what you were seeing and what you were reporting on from the very beginning so take us back to um maybe perhaps first your own experience of just living there as as things started to develop and, and growing up and then as you started to first go there and file reports and see uh firsthand what was actually taking place yeah. Okay. So, so, so uh, you know, from the beginning, I, I think I mentioned that uh, we have two parts and southern part and northern part uh, in the Rakhine state. So, in like, uh, I even uh, uh, remember to one moment that when some family moved uh, uh, to my neighborhood, uh, so my mom called me. And you know, uh, uh, he kid, the new family arrived in my in our neighborhood, and then uh, my mom called them Rakai. So we are, I'm leaving. I was leaving, and my my whole family is in Rakai. But when someone, some family moved from northern part of the state, the Rakai state, we call them also Rakai family. So like. That's why right now a lot of people from the northern part of the state always criticize the southern part is not Rakhine state, and then the southern part of the Rakhine state also uh, criticize the northern uh, uh, Rakhine people as very 
uh, uh, ethnocentric people. This kind of uh, uh, nuance issues uh, uh, happen and still happen in in, in, in Rakhine State. Uh, <clears throat> So that, that, that's the environment uh, we have to deal with. So after 2012, uh, uh, religious tensions and crises, like uh, the most significant thing in southern part of the uh, Rakhine states is, uh, you know, before 2000, 2012, like uh, the Rakhine people in southern, uh, southern part of the Rakhine state, they didn't really uh, realize that they are Rakhine. Because you know, and the event like uh, uh, ceremonies, uh, traditional ceremonies, and traditional wedding, we didn't normally uh, play the uh, traditional drums, uh, Rakhine drums. Uh, but after 2012, like after the religious tensions and crises, uh, sorry, religious tensions and crises, like most of the people really urge, encourage uh, the young people uh, to be familiar and to uh, be more close with the Rakhine traditions. So after that, you 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 could see uh, the Rakhine traditional drums uh, play, played at the ceremonies and uh, traditional weddings there. That's the significant things after 2012. Uh, uh, so after that, after in 2015, after the uh, general elections, you know, Don San Suu Kyi and the NAD party won a landslide uh, victory in 2015. So after that, like most of the people, actually most of the people expected too much from the, uh, Don San Suu Kyi and the NAD party uh, after 2015 election. Uh, so, you know, before, after 2015 and 2016, like, uh, you know, that many, uh, you, know, you can, you, you can see, uh, on the uh, vendor, uh, that you can see every newspaper with the front page, uh, uh, of Don San Suji picture. So there, there, there was one saying even that, you know, if you don't, Put uh, on San Suji picture uh, on the front page. Your your papers uh, won't be sell, won't be sold. You know uh, that that's kind of sayings we had at uh, between after 2015 election. So you have to put on San Suji's picture on the front page at the time. But uh, you know uh, after two. A lot, around uh, mid of 2015, a lot of newspapers started to criticize uh, about the like 100 days uh, of the new government, 100 days of the new ruling party. That kind of stuff we uh, started to write on the newspapers. So uh, from that moment, like most of the uh, uh, audience of the newspaper, they started to uh, 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 criticize back to the newspaper that you cannot write the uh, new government of Aung San Suu Kyi, uh, you know, because, you know, which is really, really uh, uh, new uh, uh, as a government. So you, the new newspapers and then reporters uh, shouldn't uh, criticize on the new government in Aung San Suu Kyi. I think at the time, this is the uh, 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 starting point uh, of breaking up between the audience and the newspapers. Because, you know, from that moment, so half of the newspaper choose to uh, uh, support Aung San Suu Kyi and half of the newspaper choose to uh, uh, do more uh, like uh, absolute journalism. Uh, from, like it started um, in mid-2015, uh, I guess. So, you know, but, you know, the ruling party and Aung San Suu Kyi, it's NAD, it started uh, to grow in the international media, uh, the, to, to grow the reputation in international media and then in ASEAN too. So she went a lot to, to the, you know, she, she traveled a lot um, um, as a leader of the uh, ruling party <clears throat> at the time. But nobody expected uh, the 2016 uh, uh, clearance operation of the military in 2016. Uh, so, but after 2015, that uh, the, before 2015, there were some uh, arrests and seizures of the uh, police, the uh, drugs police. That you know, you 
you you you you might uh, you might ha- you might have heard that you know like uh, ten billions worth of methamphetamines in Yabat, where it sees and uh, eastern part of the country, and you know in the border with Bangladesh and uh, Myanmar. This kind of thing you uh, you can read on the newspapers uh, uh, before two thousand fifteen. But after 2015 general election, that kind of news started to uh, 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 spread, started to be seen on the uh, newspaper periodically, like uh, more and more often. Um, So, you know, I started to look at the drugs and methamphetamines uh, 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 seizures uh, after 2015 general elections. So I, 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 I noticed that a lot of drugs and methamphetamines uh, trade, uh, uh, it's across the, the border of Golden Triangle to Shan State and uh, to Yangon, or some, sometimes it's uh, across the Mandalay, uh, uh, the Mandalay, and then it uh, goes to the uh, Rakhine State, uh, and to the Bangladesh. So I noticed that kind of route uh, by the uh, drug trafficker. So in 2000, 2016, I traced uh, that methamphetamine's uh, trading route from uh, uh, Mandalay to until to the uh, uh, the border uh, between Myanmar and Bangladesh. So. <clears throat> I went there, uh, like I even uh, I took a bus with the, uh, 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 you know, uh, with the, uh, I, I even uh, uh, rode a bus that, uh, uh, um, which, is, which was, I believe, that ca- carried methamphetamines. Um, so I rode with this bus to Rakhine State. So uh, that's in 2000, uh, 2016, I think it's on October, uh, yeah, October 10, no, October 9, 8, October 6. So I arrived in Sitwe and then I took boat from Sitwe to uh, Mondo, where the, the, the latest frontier seat, it says the township uh, uh, between the fence of the border there. <clears throat> So, you know, uh, I met a lot of uh, police majors and then the police captains there who were uh, always ready to seize uh, and arrest the drug traffickers on the border town. Border town. So on October uh, 8, I even met a, a police uh, police major, like he's the ch- uh, station chief in Mondo. So I met him uh, at around evening uh, and then he even... Uh, uh, invited me uh, when he and his forces um, going to arrest a tra- uh, drug trafficker at around midnight. So I agreed uh, to take along with with them. To, uh, you know when they are going to arrest a uh, drug trafficker, but around uh, I think midnight uh, two after midnight two a.m. in the morning, like in Mondo City, uh, the electricity is just uh, between like um, six p.m. to nine p.m. That's all three 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 hours, uh, three hours in total in Mondo. So you know after nine p.m. at night, you know there's no electricity, uh, and then and on the next day you will get electricity on six p.m. at night. But if the day on October 9th, uh, on nine of the October, uh, the, uh, the 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 electricity just you know opened uh, around two a.m. in the morning, you know, and everybody was on a lot. That you know what happens, you know, this is really rare, uh, awkward uh, for the whole city. And then uh, I called like uh, my sources around that you know what's going on, and then uh, I called the police uh, major that you know. What's what's going on uh, uh, in the city? And then he told me that it, there there was an attack by uh, 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 Muslims. He he, uh, you know, t- t- uh, uh, his exact words. The, there was attack by the Muslims and uh, and the police com- uh, military command um, in the western <clears throat> uh, part of the township. And then, but you know, we have curfews. So in that city in Mondo, so we have curfews um, uh, not to go outside after 12, yeah, 12, 12, uh, 12 a.m. And then morning, uh, 4, 4 a.m. So you cannot go outside. So we have to wait uh, uh, until 4 a.m. in the morning. So after 4 a.m., me and my photographer uh, went to a, a scene 
uh, where you know nine policemen were beheaded, and uh, half of them were beheaded, and then half of them were killed br uh, brutally uh, <clears throat> on their police uh, military command and a police uh, Boraka police command uh, in the western uh, part of the uh, Mondo township there. So you know, uh, actually. Me and my photographers, we are we were there to trace the drug trafficking stories, but you know, in the mornings, unexpectedly, uh, that you know that story just broke, uh, and then you know, as a as a reporter, as a journalist, uh, we we were so lucky that you know, we got a story uh, which is nobody got ever before. Uh, and then you know me and my photographer, uh, we went there and then we filmed uh, everything. We interview everyone there, uh, <clears throat> almost everyone there on the ground. So at the time, uh, one policeman told me that those Muslims are uh, RSO, Rohingya Solidarity uh, Organization. So that RSO uh, was really active um, around uh, 1980s. Uh, and after 1988, like uh, the, that Rohingya uh, Solidarity Organization, RSO, was really active on the border uh, between Myanmar and Bangladesh. Uh, but, you know, uh, after 1990s, like there, there was no uh, actual uh, activities of RSO in that area. Uh, but in 2016, like, uh, you know, from out of the blue, uh, like RSO appears, uh, uh, at the time, so no one's really uh, have no I no one's have idea which organizations attack that police command uh, um, in Mondo. So me too. I mean, so, uh, I didn't have any idea at that at the time who's attack uh, uh, that police command. I had no idea. So when police uh, uh, security police told me that the group attack the police command um, is RSO. And then I even uh, 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 put uh, that name RSO in my first article, um, um, which is which was I I was writing uh, I have written in uh, uh, on the ground. So I put the RSO name. <clears throat> but in the morning on October 10, like that, the state newspapers uh, officially stated that. Uh, the RSO flags and uh, uh, papers and uh, uh, clothes uh, uh, were found in some uh, houses uh, in Mondo Township. So, but you know, nobody's uh, nobody have a clear uh, 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 understanding of what's going on, on the ground. <clears throat> uh, and then, no reporters there. Me and my pho photographer, we were the only one there. Uh, so we, you know, I receive a lot of uh, uh, phone calls from international media like CNN, uh, Washington Post, Al Jazeera, a lot, you know, uh, and then they quoted me a lot at the time. Uh, <clears throat> and then, uh, uh, you know, I personally witnessed the beheaded uh, uh, body there. You know, some 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 bodies were even uh, uh, there. How can I say? There, there, and. and and testes or something like that. Uh, you know, everything is uh, uh, everything went out from their body, this kind of thing. So I I, I uh, had to see it with my own eyes. Um, yeah, that you know that happened. Uh, so so you're describing that you were kind of accidentally present at one of the most important touchstone points of the entire conflict of the Rohingya, not just present, but actually you filed, uh, exclusively filed a report about what you had witnessed and what you understood at the time as, as facts were developing that would be an article that would be heard around the world and then uh, would, would give rise to everything after that followed. So this suddenly, this, this uh, accidental article that came out when you were actually there for another reason, this launched many things in progress after this the the obviously this incident was um what was the first spark of what would go on with the greater rohingya crisis internationally and for you personally as a journalist in your professional career it put you at the center of starting to report on something that was becoming very very big not just in the country but internationally and would go on to define myanmar to this day and you were 
you, you were at the start of, of, of this very first little spark that took off and, and seeing it for what it was and then how it developed. So can you carry the story on from that initial moment of reporting on the, the beheadings of the nine police officers as the conflict developed further and, uh, and, and, and there was, there were continued events and instances to report on and you became increasingly involved. Can you tell us what happened the following few years? Uh, yeah. So, so, you know, uh, from that moment, a lot of things, uh, uh, I, you know, were going on. I didn't even uh, catch up some of the events actually. So uh, from that day, October 9th, you know, I wrote like many, many stories. I even, uh, uh, at, you know, one of the accidents, I actually remember one thing uh, that, no, that um, an, a reporter from like, he's kind of a correspondent from New York Times. So he called me, He, you know, he, we know each other. And then he called me, the uh on October October 10 that you know what's going on the ground and then he asked me that you know <clears throat> uh we we knew each other we knew each other and then t- if you could tell me everything you see on the ground and then I could understand what's going on and then I told him that you know please do not quote me as a as a source uh, on the ground and then you know that New York Times reporters uh, agree on that. And then, you know, I told them everything. You, you, you know, the understanding is the agreement that when the reporters, uh, uh, two reporters are talking about the behind the scenes issues, you know, you cannot really code it. And then I, I, I clearly uh, I asked him not to code my name. That's the, one of the incidents I remember uh, uh, in my uh, entire, uh, entire, uh, uh, entire career. That that uh, uh, correspondent, so, uh, uh, I think he interviewed me around uh, three three p.m. Uh, at the evening. Uh, so and then you know I fight too many stories at the day, and then in the morning I received uh, I, on my Facebook and Twitter uh, direct message, and uh, I received a lot of threats on my. Uh, email that you know uh, i'm uh, i'm destroying the country's reputation and then i'm uh, uh, i'm breaking the national uh, securities uh, boundaries this kind of thing you know I, I had no idea what's going on and then actually the new york time reporters quoted me everything everything i said uh, on his story so yeah so that happened so <laughs> And then, you know, I, I received even death threats at the times, you know, because, you know, I'm the only one reporter. Uh, no words uh, 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 would come out uh, unless I, I said that because I'm the only one there. Uh, but, you know, New York Times run the story. Uh, the, the whole interview, I I answered everything. That's kind of thing. You know, so, most of the things I told uh, that reporters are behind the scenes. You know, it cannot be published, you know. Some most of the time, like sometimes we have that kind of stories we cannot publish on the paper, but he he published that. So after that, when I came back to Yangon from uh, from Rakai State, we, me and my uh, editor Thomas Kane, he, he he's now an uh, uh, editor in chief of the uh, Frontier Myanmar newspapers uh, a magazine. So we uh, sent an email to uh, New York Times, uh, uh, Asia Decks, and Hong Kong, and other uh, uh, editorial decks. And then I think they changed it uh, after a week. Um, they changed my name. They, they, they removed my name from, from the article, that kind of thing. So this is uh, one of the uh, worst uh, experience of my uh, career. Um, but in 2000. After after that event in 2017, uh, June, um, so so f- f- when I came back from uh, from Mondo, uh, from the uh, from Rakhine State, I've got a lot of sources on the ground. Like uh, uh, I I've got uh, uh, a lot of phone numbers from Rohingya people there. I've got a lot of phone uh, phone numbers from uh, 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 police forces and the military too. So. Uh, the the problem is um, a lot of things going uh, on the ground, uh, like between the 
uh, villages, like because you know the uh, uh, how can I say it, the policemen who are patrolling in the ground, they know the situation, real situations on the ground, and then they reported that what's going on the ground to the. Uh, to their above level, like uh, some captain level and major general level, and no one listened about that. So most of my sources on the ground, they call me at night, like around 9 p.m. and 10 p.m., and they call me that there will be a second attack on 2017 after 2016 first attack. And then t- I received this kind of uh, uh, new steps uh, from my sources on the ground. Um, and then, to, you know, uh, I talked to some people, um, uh, like some politi- politi- uh, political leaders and some government staffs uh, that, you know, there will be a second attack in uh, 2017 around uh, uh, in rainy season. Because in Rakhine, uh, there always be a, like, uh, in, in Rakhine, if you fight in the rainy season, there, there will be a, uh, uh, several routes you can escape in Rakai State. Like when you uh, uh, check the fightings between Arakan Army and Myanmar military, most of the fightings uh, uh, were happened in rainy season. In the rainy seasons, so you know my sources told me in 2017 uh, June that you know there will be a there will be a second attack in the rainy season. Uh, they told me so. Uh, you know, at first I didn't believe that, but after several calls and you know several messages from my uh, uh, ground sources, and then you know I talked to my editor that we should run a story about the second attack that there will be a second attack. I mean, if someone's talking about that, you know that the Rohingya will attack uh, the uh, uh, the second time, uh, they will attack. No one's believed that. No one would believe that. But my editor, luckily, he believed me. And then uh, we, we published a story that there will be a second attack by the uh, Rohingya uh, in, in the rainy season. <clears throat> and then, you know, I sent that letter uh, to the uh, uh, state councilor's office. I, 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 I told... I told like almost every uh, politicians like uh, uh, who are very uh, close with me. I told them personally, and then I sent those that the news link to them that you know please read that. You know there will be a second attack, uh, and then no one's listened it. No one listened it. Uh, so <clears throat> the attack and, and and then a lot of things going on like uh, Kofi Annan commissions, and then and, and on I think they uh, did a. Uh, press conference on August 24th, uh, 24th of August. And then I even, uh, I was present at the press conference that I even asked a lot of questions to the Kofi Annan personally. Uh, <clears throat> and then I think uh, on August 25, the second attack happened. I mean, please, you know, someone, <laughs> someone, uh, can you imagine like, uh, like th- that kind of moment that, you tell the whole you you tell the whole country that there will be a second attack, and then no one listened it, and then it happened, and then it, this time it's not a uh, one police uh, uh, it's not a one police station. They attack three police ports. No, no, thirty police ports. You can imagine that. So, a lot of forces, a lot of uh, 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 police, uh, uh, Boraka police were died and killed there, a lot. So on to, uh, so after that, you know, you know, I didn't say that that kind of uh, I told you so. You know, I, I couldn't say that. But in in my feeling, like uh, in, in in my heart, like you know, I couldn't even uh, uh, feel that that kind of feeling. It's really, you know, awkward. It's really strange to feel uh, that kind of moment that. You told them, you told everyone, you published a story in English and Burmese too, both like uh, 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 bilingual stories, but no one listened. It. Uh, so why, why not? Why don't you think people listened? I, I think it's really strange for them to, I think, to believe that, you know, uh, Rohingya people will attack uh, the police outposts second time. Because you know the first time, and then a lot of international uh, <clears throat> uh, uh, 
uh, focus on the Rakhine state and then even Kofi Annan commissions. This kind of sense, you know, no one believed that. I think uh, they are afraid to believe or it's really big to believe. Maybe. I have no idea. But, you know, the story uh, uh, didn't end there. So I so after that, on 2000, uh, uh, 2017, August 26, I I talked to my editor and then we, uh, and then me and my photographer, the, you know, the photographer, Deza Lai, his name is Deza Lai. So he's like my big brother's, uh, uh, like a best friend. <clears throat> so uh, we were there, uh, we were also uh, together at the first time and then in the second time too. So we went there on August 20, 26, 2017 again. Uh, but this time, the militaries, they, they, they knew the, they knew how to, uh, how to like manipulate, how to control the media at the time, because, you know, to get to Mount, Mount Dor town, you have to, uh, you have to ride it as you have to ride, uh, f f f to get to Sidwe uh, from Yangon, you have to, uh, go with your, uh, with airplane there, uh, in Sidwe. And then when you arrive in Sitwe, you cannot go to Mondo directly. You have to sleep uh, one night there. And then in the morning, you can take a ferry boat uh, from um, Sitwe to Budidon, uh, there. So it's like a five or six hour uh, 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 drive by ferry boat. Uh, and then when you uh, arrived at the uh, Budidon, you have to uh, sleep another night to get to uh, uh, Mondo. Uh, again, so it's a 16, no, 15 or 14 kilometers from uh, Budidon to Mondo. So, uh, but, you know, uh, me and my photographers, and th this time we are not, we were not alone. So we were with other reporters from uh, uh, China News Asia, writers, AFP, uh, uh, like almost uh, every international, big international media, so they are BBC too. Uh, I mean, some uh, a reporter from Guardians, I think. So they were there too. So <clears throat> we hire a car, and then t it's around thirty reporters, like uh, over thirty reporters at the time. And then uh, we hired a car, and then uh, uh, we went to a uh, uh, Mondo. But we have to cross. Uh, three uh, Boraka police checkpoints to get to Mondo. So at the first checkpoint, I think it's a uh, uh, five miles, five five miles, four kilometers from uh, uh, Uh So it's if, if the uh, like uh, one third uh, of the uh, whole road. So there 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 was a one police uh, security checkpoint there. <clears throat> and then we were asked that, you know, who are you? Where, where, where are you going? And then we told the security that, you know, we are journalists uh, from China News Asia, CNN, uh, uh, Asia Zero, you know, Guardian, writers, EFB. And then, you know, okay, you, if you're a journalist, you cannot go there. So every reporter is there, you know, we, had, we were so disappointed at the time. And then to some of the uh, people even to try to give them a, a, a like a beaten nets that's, you know, uh, and some kind of uh, why a petroleum to give them to, 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 to cross the choke points there. Yeah. So, but, you know, at the end, no, uh, the answer is uh, clearly uh, no. And then we had to uh, come back from the checkpoint to put it down again. Uh, but around, so so most of the reporters, they decided to go back to Sidri from put it down. So it's a five hour drive. Uh, but me, I and another local, two local journalists decided not to go back to Sidri. And then uh, we disguised ourselves. So we, we took undercover and then I changed my clothes. Like uh, I normally, when I was uh, uh, reporting from the ground, I normally wore the pants, like a, tr a trouser uh, uh, and jeans, sometimes jeans and uh, with sneaker or with like a uh, all-star converse uh, uh, shoes like that. But at that time, no, you know, I, 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 I can't do that. So I changed the traditional Burmese longi uh, and then uh, not with backpack, with a uh, traditional uh, side, side back, 
uh, <clears throat> and I choose the bitter nuts a lot. Uh, and you know, I had to uh, uh, mix up my uh, hairs that look like a, a local. And then another, yeah, another two local journalists, uh, they also, you know, change their clothes, but very like look like a very poor native. Uh, and then we buy a uh, 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 two thousand chats worth uh, bitter nuts and then uh, three liters of petroleum, uh, because you know. It's really easy to give them a <clears throat> petroleum or bitter nuts if you uh, cross that border, that three checkpoints. It's a kind of a custom for them. So uh, most of the passengers and most of the drivers, they normally do that. So we uh, had to be a, a local, you know. So that's why we pretended like a, no, uh, 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 a local. <clears throat> and then at the first checkpoint, so I, I, I'm a, a, a Rakhine ethnic, so but I'm not from northern uh, northern part. But you know, I, I I can understand and I could speak uh, uh, some of the basic uh, Rakhine language. So you know, at the first uh, uh, checkpoint, you know that security uh, guy, you know, the, the, he he didn't recognize me. Uh, that's why you know he asked me, you know, where are you going? Ah, oh, we we forgot some uh, uh, our uh, uh, things and our houses uh, in Mondo. That's why you know. We, we go back to, to, to take our things back. And then, okay, uh, please give me a, a, a petroleum. And then we have to give them a, a one liter of petroleum <clears throat> uh, to a security guy. So that's the first security uh, uh, checkpoint. So and second security, uh, so it's it's really easy. It's getting easy because, you know, if the first security checkpoint is let, them, let, 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 let us uh, uh, come in, so second, is okay, so but I we have to give that uh, uh, bitter nuts, a, a one pick of bitter nuts, and then the third uh, time, so <clears throat> it's really easy. So, so the entrance of the Mondo town is uh, we call it uh, three mines checkpoint. So at that checkpoint, there are uh, that the, the, there was one UN office there. I think it's WFP, World Food Program Office there. And then, to, uh, so you have to cross a one kilometer uh, uh, gap between the uh, actual entrance of the town and then to the checkpoints. Uh, so there were once uh, one of the biggest uh, Rohingya uh, village villages there. So the name of the village is Nyutji. So if you ask someone from Rakhine that, you know, have you heard about Myodaji? Everyone knows that village because it's a very big uh, uh, village in Mondo. So we have to cross that village. So because, you know, I remember in 2016, a year ago, that the whole situation, the whole environment, the whole scenario, like I even which, uh, 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 you know, I, I I even uh, uh, noticed the differences uh, between which uh, shops uh, is open and you know and and, and which uh, road that that kind of detail stuffs I I noticed that so from that time every villages were banned uh, f- like the gap between the three mile checkpoints to the entrance of the mondo. So, you know, I filmed uh, uh, with my phone, I filmed, uh, 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 you know, from the, from the window, like, uh, like a, uh, uh, you know, lying down uh, uh, on the, uh, 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 the end of band. band. Uh, so, and then we entered to a model town. So there's nothing, there was nothing uh, on the streets. Like even there's no dogs, uh, street dogs on, on, on the streets. I mean, the in the center of Mondo town, it's like the, 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 there's there's uh, a biggest uh, 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 market uh, in the center of the uh, uh, town, but you know, no one's there. Every, every the whole town is uh, like quiet. And then, so you know, we decided uh, me and other two local journalists, we decided to go to the, uh, the shelter because you know a lot of Rakhine and Hindu people 
uh, they run from their village because you know b- before the attack on t- um, August 25, like a lot of Muslims and Rakhine and Hindu, they live together. Uh, like uh, they live together and uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, villages uh, near Mount Rowe. So after the attack uh, on t- August 25, like uh, many Rakhine and Hindus, they. Uh, 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 they, you know, they they, they are afraid of uh, some Muslims. They are uh, afraid of that, you know, uh, some like some rumors that that the Muslims are coming to uh, come in to murder them. Like at night, if you if you are Rakhine or if you are if you are Hindu, the Muslims will kill them. That kind of rumors spread uh, across the city. That's why they leave their home. They they, they uh, and then they take uh, refuge at the uh, Buddhist monastery there. So and then we, uh, I interviewed uh, uh, a lot of Buddhist and Rakai, uh, Buddhist uh, Rakai Buddhist people and uh, uh, Buddhist monastery, um, and then uh, I went to a, a, a primary school. There a lot of Hindus, uh, uh, Hindus are uh, 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 taking shelter uh, in the primary school. So I interviewed a lot of them, but. When I, me and my uh, other local journalists, we uh, came out of the refugee camps. So one um, local Rakai uh, man approaches and then asks questions that, you know, uh, who are you? Uh, you know, why are you in town? And this town is our, our town, you know, no strangers from outside. This, this is our town. So he's the Rakai Buddhist and uh, he's kind of a drunk. But, you know, <clears throat> In my instant, I know that he's not, he's looked like a drunk man, but he's not drunk, but he's kind of a, he's high. I mean, uh, he's high with some kind of methamphetamines or yaba, some kind of drugs. You know, I can see that. So we, uh, so me and other two uh, local journalists, we, uh, we avoided uh, not to confront with him. But normally, like if someone approaches that, you know, where are you? Who are, where are you from? Who are you? And we always ready to answer. You know, <laughs> you know, we're journalists. Yeah, we're journalists, and we're from Yangon, and you know, we're doing uh, 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 interviews here. But at the time, we avoided the not to confront because this is really tense. And then if someone's talking on the streets, it's this the environment is like every everyone's uh, 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 hearing. What, what are you saying? This kind of thing, because you know the whole environment is really quiet. It's really scary. So that meant access to questions, and then we say uh, uh, we are journalists, and then we are starting to uh, go back to the monastery. So we are finished, and then he uh, 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 follow us uh, with his motor motorbike, and then he, he always shouted uh, to the environment that uh, you cannot be here, uh, you shouldn't be here. This is our town. This is our, uh, uh, our our city. This is our territory. You cannot be here. Please go back uh, or, or where you came from. And then we say, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, we are living. We are living. To, uh, and, and then, to, you know, we notice that the situation is not really a good. And then so we uh, had to ask, uh, ask help from someone who's like a respectable person uh, uh, from the political party or something like that. So we went back to a Buddhist monastery uh, where we interviewed a lot of uh, uh, refugees, Buddhist refugees, Rakhine refugees there. And then we met, uh, uh, fortunately we met uh, 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 Rakhine uh, Arakan National Party's MP, member of parliament from uh, Arakan National Party. So uh, we, we know each other. And then we asked that um, member of parliament that, you know, uh, hello, Anka, you know, uh, uh, we, we, we are in trouble. That guy's followers. And then he asked a lot of uh, dangerous questions that, you know, you can be here, you can be here, you shouldn't be here. And then that uh, uh, member of parliament uh, uh, told that drunk guy, high guy, that, you know, okay, please calm down. You know, uh, you cannot uh, 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 shout it at the reporters who are doing their job. And then that guy, uh, you know, he he, he didn't, uh, uh, he wasn't calmed down. And then uh, he started to uh, organize other people that, please look around, please come around here. And then here's the strangers from the outside. They are not the native, please come around here. And then some other drunk men and some other uh, 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 people just uh, started to organize there. And then 
Um, that drunk guy asks us uh, the, uh, to show our uh, 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 name cards and other other stuffs like uh, so. Uh, uh, two local reporters show their name cards. That you know, one from Awadi and another one from uh, Democratic Vice Obama. And then I, I actually uh, made a joke there because you know I gave them my notebook, not not my uh, uh, name tag. <laughs> and then he said, "No, no, it's 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 a notebook, not your name name tag." <laughs> and then. Uh, uh, you know, I said, no, 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 I forgot that, that uh, uh, and boot it on. And then he said, yeah, 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 okay. So after that, the member of parliament started to shout at him that, you know, you shouldn't do that. They are reporters. Uh, if you say something bad, you know, they, they were, they were uh, uh, write it in their newspapers. And then that guy, no, you know, uh, 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 fuck off, you know, I don't really care, you know. And then uh, one we were really lucky that one elder elder woman uh he she uh, approaches she's like around 60 or 17 he approaches and then uh, uh told us very uh, uh she whispered us that you know please go please run you know this guy's really dangerous and then we collected our things and then we literally run from that monastery and then that guy shouted to the uh, uh environment that you know Come around, you know. Uh, look out! Come around! Uh, please come out to the streets, you know. This guy should be killed. These guys should be killed. So we have to run out, you know, uh, uh, from that monastery. Uh, uh, you know, we, we had no idea where 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 we go go going. You know, where are we moving? Where are we heading? We had no idea. But you know, at the time, we have to you know, decide something with the other two local reporters. Yeah, but please, please do something. Please do something at the time. So, because you know the mob uh, followers at, the t- at, at that moment, so the mob shouted at the environment, "Come out!" Uh, and you know uh, th- these guys should be killed. Uh, these guys should uh, should uh, can't be here. Shouldn't be here. So that uh, 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 voice, you know, uh, echoed uh, in the empty street, empty road. So we have to run from that that monasteries and then that mob followers, and then uh, uh, so we decided to go to uh, <clears throat> uh, the head office of the Arakan Nation parties. So this is the only place that we should uh, 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 we should go because you know there's no no other areas. There's uh, the, the police stations are closed. Uh, uh, the uh, 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 townships, municipalities are closed. Every 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 where it's closed, so the only place we should go is to go to the uh, uh, Arakan Nation Party uh, uh, office, and then uh, there we met a uh, uh, because you know we thought that if someone is influential in the politics, you know if she if he or she says something to the mob, and they were they will be calmed down. We, we 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 thought that, so uh, at the at the uh, uh, office, you know, we asked help uh, uh, at the, uh, one guy. I I, I don't know who is he. Uh, so he he said that okay, uh, no worries. Uh, we will uh, hire a car for you, uh, and then uh, actually from Mondo to Budidong, it's like uh, fifteen kilometers. So we. Uh, have to pay around f- like five fifty do- dollars, or no, uh, twenty dollars, or sometimes it's uh, fifteen dollars. That's all. But at the time, that guy uh, in the Arakan Nation Party, he charges like fifty fifty dollars. So it's it's uh, like a double trouble uh, than the normal price. But you know, we had no choice, and then you know, he hired a car with that fifty dollars, and then we have to uh, take that burn. Um, and then we we run with that band from from Mondo. and then the whole uh, 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 village uh, uh, between the whole Muslim villages between the entrance of the Mondo town and the checkpoints all are burned down. So I find everything, and even some of the uh, uh, road uh, 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 some the 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 road. Is, is, the uh, the platforms of the roads are uh, uh, um, whole uh, uh, by the like uh, explosive devices there a lot, and then t- what I saw is uh, many uh, local Rakhine residents are helping the military there. 
because you know when the military uh, burned the Rohingya houses uh, and in the village, like the local residents are helping them to uh, to grab some kind of solar power uh, uh, machine and some kind of uh, generators. Uh, because you know there there are so many wealthy Muslims houses in that neighborhood, uh, so uh, when the uh, uh, the military uh, uh, like uh, destroyed the Muslim houses, so the locals uh, try help them to carry this kind of uh, properties from the Muslim houses. I saw that, but at the time, I. I cannot write uh, that kind of uh, uh, information on my on my article. So if that uh, uh, if that's published on the uh, uh, on the uh, on my magazine, I will be arrested for sure. So I talk to my yeah, I talk to my uh, editors and I talk to my friends that you know should I I put that kind of information in my articles? You know, everyone say no. It's it's really dangerous. It's really dangerous because you know the military will sue you for sure, and then the military will attack your family for sure, and because you know my family is in Rakhine State. Sure. Yeah. So. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I want to ask a question about uh, Rakhine specifically and the the authorities there. You're you're from Rakhine State. You've reported extensively on the growing conflict in, in Rakhine with the Rohingya and, and uh, the issues surrounding that. And you reference in, in that harrowing story in which a mob is literally chasing you, and that, that's an incredible behind-the-scenes understanding for any listener to have of what you how, how you had to put yourself in harm's way to simply report on a story. You reference how you you sought the help of the authorities, the political party, the the, the local governance that's there, and I, I just want to fast forward uh, five six years down the line to present day and looking at uh, trying to understand the uh, w- what's had the motivations and. Um, the actions in Rakhine State since the coup. There's been some reporting from different angles. There's, uh, it, it's been reported that the, the the CDM movement has has never really taken off in Rakhine. That they're they're feeling among Rakhine Buddhists that they uh, there's some hesitation and in, in to what degree they want to join the, the democratic movement resisting the coup with feeling that that they were not supported by the majority before so they they don't know how much they want to put themselves on a limb and and, and join the wider movement there's also been uh, there's been quite a bit of attention about AA, the Aircon Army, and uh, specifically some of the comments and the direction led by uh, the, the one of the commanders, the spokesperson, uh, Tu Mian Nang, who has articulated the the position not only of AA but also Rakhine State in general. And the AA is considered, I believe, one of the the, the greater fighting forces, even reveling the the, the Tamada, uh, of the different ethnic militias and, and militaries forces that are there. And so looking at post-coup, of course, uh, understanding the history before that, both in terms of your lived experience, being a a member of the Rakhine community and the reporting that you did many years prior leading up to this point, what's your understanding of what's going on in Rakhine State now, of their their motivations, of what they're working towards, of their their feelings um, since the coup, and what the um, the actions that they're 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 taking and what they're working towards. What? Uh, how can you update us about the situation in Rakhine since the coup? So what's uh, right now? All the uh, Rakhine people in the Rakhine state. What they're saying is, we had enough. It's enough for us, because you know, <clears throat> uh, after the coup, like and uh, KNU and current state and uh, KIA and uh, Kachin. Uh, so they're fighting against the militaries uh, um, uh, after the uh, uh, People's Defense Forces in March after uh, uh, the, around last year, April. So the KNU started to fight. Uh, uh, KIA is still fighting uh, until today. Uh, <clears throat> but, you know, everyone uh, is talking about Rakhine, that Arakan army, why, why, why they didn't fight against the military? That question. So all the people are in Rakhine state, Said that you know 
it's enough for us. You know, we had like five years of fighting, like a very intense fight in the Rakhine State uh, from 2015 to 2020, 2021. So it's it's enough for them. That that that's what they are they are saying uh, on the social media and on the ground too. So when someone uh, asks that, you know, uh, why are you involved or why aren't you re- uh, involved in that uh, 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 revolutions? And so they say the same thing. Yeah, where it's enough for us. Uh, but the thing is, um, the American army uh, is now in upper hand. He, they, they are they are in the upper hand of the national unity government or an alliance with the northern northern alliance uh, 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 relationship and then you know because you know if like some people and and Yangon they even said that uh, some scholars said that if Rakai uh, doesn't want to uh, uh, be involved in uh, in this revolution uh, it's fair enough for them so nobody can blame them. Because you know, uh, uh, because the the narrative is uh, when our army is fighting uh, um, and against the Myanmar military before the coup, so even to Aung San Suu Kyi and other uh, our, our ruling parties members, and then even the the uh, well known celebrities uh, on the Facebook, they even urge the Myanmar military to annihilate uh, uh, the uh, uh, our army on the ground. So some. Um, uh, influencers and some pro uh, National League for Democracy uh, uh, influencers said that if uh, uh, please uh, 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 play the national anthem in Rakhine, if someone cannot sing along the national anthem, please kill them. This kind of uh, 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 online hate speech he posted on the social media and he did a lot of uh, support uh, at the time uh, around 2018 and 19. Uh, so you know, a lot of Rakhine people are uh, uh, they 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 think that it's it's not for them to not to fight against the military anymore at the time. Uh, <clears throat> but I think Arakan army has another uh, ambition uh, ambition this time because you know they are uh, uh, like uh, uh, not significantly involved in the revolution, but uh, some of their soldiers. Uh, state fighting in the uh, Northern Alliance with the KIA and the TNLA in the North. And then some of the Arakan army uh, uh, soldiers are fighting against the military in the current state too. But, you know, uh, some, of the, some, of the, some of the things they cannot uh, uh, say uh, on the press release. Uh, and, you know, it's like uh, if, as I said before, if the uh, Arakan army doesn't want to, if the Arakan army says that we don't want to fight in this revolution, no one can blame them. So it's their situation because, you know, no one support them when they are fighting uh, the uh, military before the coup. So that's that's what they're thinking, I think. Right. So thanks for that update that is looking at the situation and the perspective from Rakhine State and definitely be interested to see how that plays out. I also wonder if you know much about or have any commentary about the Japanese envoy from the Nippon Foundation, Yohei Sasakawa, that's been involved in negotiations, especially in uh, Rakhine State with AA and the Tamada. And I, I think there's been a bit of controversy or, or just questioning about what exactly his role is, what his influence is, what his motivations are. Uh, what thoughts do you have about him? And actually, I, I guess before the thoughts of him, may, I, our listeners might not exactly know who he is or what role he's played. Maybe you can update a bit about what, uh, what, what he's done and then your thoughts on it. Um, so Japan, Japanese governments as always, uh, 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 they, uh, pretended to play it as a, uh, a peacemaker uh, in every occasion. So like uh, they, uh, like like a Japanese Nippon Foundation, uh, they uh, made a lot of charities uh, uh, activities uh, in Rakhine State and the, the whole country actually. Like if like you can see uh, uh, the activities of the U.S. aid and other U.S. related organizations are doing uh, a lot of works on the ground, but you cannot uh, actually see what the Nippon Foundation's uh, uh, 
do uh, uh, did in uh, in Karen and other ethnic area. You cannot find it because they are really low low profile. Uh, 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 and uh, in our sensitive time and what they say in er- error and then uh, at the time too so they're, they're really low profile and then t- uh, they are really close with the Myanmar military too uh, so when t- because you know the, and the case with the Northern Alliance or Arakan Army or Karen whatever it is like if the if the uh, uh, um, um, uh, Chinese Yunnan government involved in that peace talk like uh, Northern Alliance or other uh, 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 Burma majority uh, openings will be very different. That you know, and and then at, at that point, that the other uh, uh, ethnic um, organizations also think that you know uh, they they always put the Chinese uh, 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 Chinese uh, envoy uh, for the for the peace negotiation as a, another. Uh, kind of uh, behind the curtain uh, 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 negotiations. So they never put the Chinese uh, uh, representatives, uh, they never uh, 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 acknowledge uh, the Chinese representatives' peace making discussions um, uh, on the record. Uh, you know, we are we all we always heard that the Chinese representatives met with the Northern Alliance in Pansang and Wa State. <clears throat> and uh, Chinese representative made the Myanmar military representatives in uh, uh, Mongla, the Golden Triangle area, but no one um, uh, ever released a statement about that. But when, uh, uh, if the Japanese uh, 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 and or Japanese representatives met with uh, uh, ethnic uh, organizations, they always make a press release because you know, and that's. Uh, I think that's a play on the uh, Myanmar people's opinion because you know most of the, uh, uh, always Myanmar people uh, uh, Myanmar people always think that Chinese uh, uh, government control the uh, uh, ethnic armed forces, but uh, ethnic armed forces n- never acknowledge that, and then t- they are re- afraid. I think afraid to uh, acknowledge uh, uh, that. They are under the control of Chinese government. Ethnic uh, organizations they never uh, acknowledge it, uh, acknowledge the Chinese involvement uh, on the records. That's why I think uh, uh, the uh, Myanmar military also uh, are willing to. Uh, they are willing to use. They are willing to uh, talk uh, to the ethnic organizations uh, uh, with the Japanese uh, envoy and Sasakawa this time. Because you know, when uh, military, the, the Myanmar military or the ethnic and uh, um, um, groups said that uh, the peacemaker is from Japan, so and then to, in, in to, to the Myanmar people uh, say that okay, you know, some guy from uh, 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 Japan, it's 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 okay, but someone from China uh, will be involved in the, in a the peace negotiation. They will be really uh, outrageous. Uh, I think. Japanese envoys uh, um, played a lot, uh, uh, and then that you know the Myanmar, Myanmar people's opinions on the Chinese and Japanese is it's really different. Uh, <clears throat> so you know when the Sasakawa went to uh, uh, Rakhine State, like uh, I think only some of the local uh, newspapers in Rakhine State uh, wrote about that. N- you know, not so many mainstream media uh, 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 mentioned that you know Japanese. Uh, peace uh, negotiate uh, arrive in uh, Rakhine. I think they 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 didn't highlight that kind of thing because you know, most of the majority of people in Myanmar they uh, think that Japanese is not Japanese is Japanese. You know, it's not they are not Chinese. This kind of thing. Uh, <clears throat> I think you know in the uh, uh, Arakan army too. They 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 would make they, they always uh, make a press release in Chinese and English and uh, and Burmese. Uh, no, but you know they 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 never acknowledge that 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 you know uh, uh, they are under the control of the uh, Chinese government. You know officially. Uh, and then uh, they never, you know, mentioned that kind of Chinese term uh, in the press release. Uh, that's really sensitive for Rakhine people and uh, the majority people uh, 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 in Yangon and Mandalay too. Uh, I think that's that's why they avoid this kind of thing. So, but you know, Japanese envoy, yeah, it's okay for them. Yeah.
Mm, right. So I'm wondering about with the recline situation, you, you've been speaking about this uh, quite objectively as a, as a reporter and looking at the different motivations and angles of the different parties. And I wonder if you can have a subjective answer of being, a, being from recline state, a member of the recline community, and yet also uh, a, a Myanmar citizen who is concerned about the, uh, the military takeover and wanting to see a, the democratic movement succeed in um, wh- where do you lie on this? Do you, when, when you allow yourself to think subjectively about your, ho- your, your hopes of the greater democracy movement, as well as the situation in Rakhine and their, their own safety and, um, and autonomy to whatever degree that means, what do you, do you have any, uh, subjective thoughts or, or, or hopes about how things might turn out or how things could turn out? Um, so the, <laughs> this questions I've been always asked um, like too many years ago as well. Uh, <clears throat> so it's still uh, a hard to draw a conclusion at the time uh, because you know the, right now there's one uh, uh, one thought that you know R- Rakai the Arakan army uh, is considering to uh, be separated from the mainland or they are uh, hoping. Uh, to get a confederation or the like a special uh, 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 zone, <clears throat> special zone or something like that. Because in a war state, like it's a, a special uh, 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 autonomous zones, and then in, in Mongla too, it's a special uh, autonomous zone. But uh, uh, I think I when I interviewed Tomia Nine in 2019, I uh, asked him. Uh, uh, like uh, on the record that what's your goal or oh, you know it's it, it you know it, 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 uh, um, uh, are you MB of uh, 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 you know uh, uh, what state and then he, he answered that you know yes uh, we dreamed uh, uh, about uh, 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 we dreamed Rakai state as another kind of war state uh, and uh, <clears throat> and uh, you know not less than war state uh, but you know it's the same level uh, uh, with war state uh, he, he said it too but right now the, the current situation in Rakhine state is so Rakhine uh, uh, Arakan army always uh, uh, they are proud to uh, 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 show the photos that you know the 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 state schools in Rakhine State, the the, uh, uh, the 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 students in the state schools in Rakhine State, they always sing in the Rakhine uh, Arakan armies aid them, um, in in the state schools. So they the Arakan armies, pro Arakan armies, influencers, and the uh, people on the social medias, they always proud to uh, 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 post this kind of uh, that kind of photos on the social media but actually on the ground um, the people uh, uh, the Rakhine people are in the dilemma that you know they have to pay uh, different taxes uh, 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 like you know they have to pay the tax uh, to the Arakan army at the same time they have to pay tax to the uh, uh, military government right now so <clears throat> it's it's like you know uh, which one is their true uh, administrators. So they don't know it. They have no idea. But the the, the processes stay ongoing. So on the other hand, uh, like when the Arakan army said that we occupy like one third of the Rakhine state, if they are saying like that kind of thing, they they never said it on the record. But like some of the pro Arakan army followers said that you know uh, in the northern part of the Rakhine state, Arakan army like occupy some of the village villages and then some cities there. But you know uh, uh, honestly, uh, actually um, they cannot um, uh, handle. They cannot control the Chinese. Uh, 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 special economic zones there. They cannot control the shuegas there. Uh, they cannot control the uh, 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 trade uh, tax there. Like a month ago, the Arakan army uh, uh, announced that to make a business uh, uh, with the, uh, the Bangladesh uh, government. Uh, so that's kind of thing they are, are started to uh, they started to uh, offer to the Bangladesh right now, but uh, th- th- no official response from the Bangladesh until <clears throat> until now. 
So I think uh, Arakan Army is winning the battle on the paper right now. But uh, uh, um, actually, like uh, 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 on the ground, they just started to uh, control the administrations. They just started because you know uh, before the coup, they are they 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 given trainings to the educated Rakhine people uh, for the uh, public administrations there, but they just started to. Uh, 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 practice that kind of um, uh, their own administrative uh, bodies there, but they just started. But it's not the it's not really easy as well for uh, uh, easy to accept to give uh, 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 the autonomous area uh, uh, to the Rakhine Arakan army from uh, uh, from the Myanmar military because in the in the mindset of the Myanmar military, I think they would think that, you know, they already gave Wa State and Maunla. And then, you know, uh, look at look at that right now. You know, uh, no one can uh, even touch the Maunla uh, uh, autonomous area and the Wa State. And then that's kind of a shame for the Myanmar military all the time, all the time. And then, you know, always, you know, people are making joke about the war state that, you know, uh, there's one picture of uh, uh, the head of the war state army uh, uh, lying on the hospital bed. And then the uh, state, uh, 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 right now, the dictator, me online, uh, uh, you know, sp- uh, uh, spawning uh, the soup t- to the leader of the war state. So we're always making joke with that photo that the Myanmar military, uh, uh, they are always afraid of the war army, war state army. So, you know, they are really ashamed of uh, that. And then I think the Myanmar military will never, uh, 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 I think they would uh, uh, afraid, would be afraid to give another part of the uh, country to uh, Arakan army uh, anymore. I think they will give like maybe two or three townships in the northern part of the state to Arakan army to be, you know, managed by the Arakan army, but they would never, I, I, in my opinion, uh, you know, they, they would be reluctant uh, to give uh, another autonomous area um, uh, yeah. to the new new army. I don't think so. Mm. I don't think so. Right. There will be a more more negotiation. Yeah. Right, right. So the last question I want to ask you is zooming out a little bit and looking at the situation of journalism at this time and looking at the the needs and challenges and ambitions of reporting right now with what's been going on since the coup, as bad as things are and as terrible as the incidents, uh, the ongoing incidents continue to be, it is dangerous and challenging to be able to accurately and safely report on it, get information out. Uh, the uh, The military often is taking these atrocious actions, and then after the actions, they're trying to make sure no one is around to be able to report on them and punish those attempting to do so. So as you look overall at the state of journalism right now in trying to report on what's been going on in Myanmar since the coup, what what, what are you seeing? What are your hopes? What are your concerns? What, what would you like to see? What do you think the challenges are? What needs are there? Uh, how would you characterize um, the, the state of journalism right now since the coup? Um, so it's a, it's a chaos right now. So it, uh, it's already... Uh, like the whole journalism scheme, but it's, it's, it's already destroyed. So what I'm really sad uh, uh, at that moment is, you know, the mainstream, like most of the mainstream medias, they uh, don't follow the standard journalism rules anymore. So that's happening right now. Um, so <clears throat> uh, some prominent and uh, 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 reputable and respectful uh, uh, journalists uh, 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 try to uh, like calm the situation down uh, in the journalism industry because you know like some of the mainstream medias are f- f- given more want uh, uh, than the need to the uh, uh, audience because you know right now what 
the kind of news that uh, 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 please to uh, to the audience is uh, kind of you know the PDF killed uh, twenty uh, military soldiers uh, in Zagai, or thirty uh, 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 military trucks were uh, bombed. Uh, 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 by the exploded device by the PDFs and Karen. This kind of news people want to hear. So, and then the problem is the uh, reporters are not on the ground. Reporters cannot see what's happening on the ground. So, most of the mainstream media they have to rely on the sources. The right known sources are the PDFs groups. So, so all the mainstream media is writing. Uh, attributing the source uh, uh, of the PDF, so we have to be very careful that you know all the time it's very basic that if something happened in some uh, um, area, if something happened between two organizations, but whatever the organizations, we have to when some organization when one of those two organizations told that if that happened in that area, so we have to ask another uh, uh, opposite organization that it is, this has really happened. That's the basic rule. But right now, everything's on the mainstream medias are by one-sided news that if some organization said that, and then it's, you know, people are happy about that. If one organization said, so we have no uh, uh, fat check. So we have no f- uh, fat check mechanisms anymore. So, and then, you know, everyone's happy about that. So, so you know, one of my uh, uh, journalist friends make make even a joke, joke joke about that. You know, we have to uh, uh, solve the people. So that so you know, if uh, people are happy about that, and then <laughs> just so this kind of things is happening. So you know, I personally uh, I, I wrote a lot of fact check stories. Like so, it's like a you know, when someone uh, tells that. Uh, when someone uh, 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 talks to people that, you know, that's not true. You know, you cannot kill 30 soldiers at one time with uh, two bombs or three bombs. It's not even an RPG. So if you want to, like in the in the battlefield, if you uh, launch a, 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 a RPG uh, to a truck, like it can kill like maybe uh, uh, sometimes it's a five or six <clears throat> soldiers in the truck. But right now, when some some uh, 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 re- organization said uh, that on the ground, they can even destroy uh, the tank with an RPG. So that's useless. That's pointless. But you know, people believe that. So uh, you know, it's 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 a it's a kind of a disaster for the journalism. So, but. Uh, People believe that kind of news, so you know we have to. And then is there's no way to uh, talk uh, uh, each other in the journalism industry too, because you know some of the uh, it's really polarized uh, uh, situations in in Myanmar and also right now in most of the uh, uh, media organizations are in Chiang Mai, Thailand, Mesok, and some of them are in another country. So you know uh, uh, all media. Like you know, and very ba- basically, so if you are writing a uh, uh, short news, like uh, we always, you know, uh, uh, have to read like maybe five or six paragraphs. Sometimes the breaking news, one or two paragraphs. That's all. But right now, uh, and all uh, main, like almost ninety uh, uh, percent of the mainstream media's uh, and all news, they only uh, write maybe three three paragraphs. That's all. And people accept that. Okay, three paragraphs, four paragraphs, or whatever it is. Like, but your news have to be uh, uh, the title that you know PDF or the the the, the PDF kills the Myanmar military dictator soldiers. That's all. So, so you know, th- I think it's been a year right now. It's been uh, over a year for, from uh, uh, last year February. So I think for the whole journalism uh, industry, I think all the uh, uh, you know, we have to uh, 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 control and we have to uh, educate ourselves. Like we have to uh, 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 talk more uh, uh, awareness of how the people uh, 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 should read the needs story. Because, you know, and then if the, uh, if the media publish a lot of 
like one story, like people get more uh, illusion that, you know, like, you know, I've been receiving messages from my sources and from my friends and families that the revolution is going to uh, finish very soon. They believe that. So, you know, I, I had to uh, explain uh, what kind of revolutions are we living in, what kind of uh, uh, killings and murderings or bombings, uh, 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 violence uh, uh, we are living in. We I, I have to personally explain them that, you know, the revolution uh, or the killing is not going to be finished very soon. So it, it will take time, maybe one or two years, maybe more than two years. But what the people on the ground believe that is the revolution is going to be finished maybe in two or three months. So they, what, that's what they believe. Because, you know, all the time they are reading news like, uh, uh, soldiers were killed by PDF, you know, 30 soldiers, 50 soldiers, this kind of news they, they've been reading. So that kind of scheme, you know, makes them believe that the revolution is going to be finished very soon. So, so you know, it's a sad, sad story. It's a really sad story to tell. But, you know, b- because, you know, the media are failed to educate the people what's really happened. I think... Uh, maybe in next six months or maybe next uh, 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 a year, one year, I think all the media will be going back to normal standard uh, uh, situation. Uh, uh, we'll be write, write, writing uh, news and articles uh, and a standard uh, 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 rules, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, thank you. That's a somber note to end on. And uh, I think it definitely calls attention to the role of civil society and to the, uh, as we talk, it's kind of a, also a fitting end and looking at how you began the interview and looking at the the challenges of journalism before the transition and the golden years, which were, were, were still um, not, uh, not, not completely ideal in terms of the um, the combination of journalism with either activism or or political goals or or whatnot, but now back to a situation where it's uh, it's just struggling with basic facts and and of course the conditions are so so challenging there in, in which to report and also touching upon this idea of false hope you know that from the very beginning literally the first days of the coup there was there there's been these kind of false hopes either in fake news or in false optimism that of of various NUG leaders that the promise this or that. And so that is also an ongoing challenge that has to be reckoned with. But I, I think, uh, I think it's good. To, it's, it's very important to be identifying and talking about what these issues are, even when they are somber and distressing, we, we need to be able to speak about them in, in English to the foreign and diaspora community and Burmese and ethnic languages to those in the country and to continue this conversation on and to, uh, to 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 be honest and and direct about um, you know now now is very much the time to 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 confront these issues and speak about them openly uh, with an attempt to try to understanding that better comprehension of what it is we're talking about to, can leave can lead to more honest and better possible solutions. So I, I hope that this is the first step to that. But uh, in any case, I, I, I really thank you for your time, for taking the time to explain these things in so much detail and the firsthand access that you have to these events, I, I think is very educational for, for me and for many listeners. So thanks for that. Thank you. Thank you. I think uh, for, you know, f- for the last one, I think um, people have been uh, learned a lot from the revolution. I believed because you know in the first days, uh, first days of the coup, like uh, February and like around March, like people believe that the UN peacekeeping force are coming t- to uh, rescue Myanmar people, and the UN pe- like a US drone uh, 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 are coming to kill uh, the main online like in March, like people really believe that kind of news. Like, uh, you know, I, I couldn't even, uh, 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 I, I don't want to check my uh, Facebook memories this time because, you know, all the news are, it's that, that, that kind of fake news 
and then the respectful persons they really believe that kind of new but that has been over a year right now and then people learn a lot i think learned a lot so i think that's kind of a lessons and lesson learned uh uh, uh will be a kind of a something uh, uh different in the future for my country and for my own people i hope Many of you know that in addition to running the Insight Myanmar podcast platform, we also formed a nonprofit, Better Burma, to respond to the terror the Burmese military has been inflicting on the country and its people. We encourage listeners to check out our blog to see the work that Better Burma has been carrying out, along with the upcoming projects that we're hoping to support. Right now, as I'm sure you all know, and today's interview only reinforced, the ongoing need is overwhelming. A donation of any amount goes directly towards those vulnerable communities who need it most, and it will be so greatly appreciated. If you would like to join in our mission to support those in Myanmar who are being impacted by the military coup, we welcome your contribution in any form, currency, or transfer method. Your donation will go to support a wide range of humanitarian missions, aiding those local communities who need it most. Donations are directed to such causes as the Civil Disobedience Movement, CDM, families of deceased victims, internally displaced person IDP camps, food for impoverished communities, military defection campaigns, undercover journalists, monasteries and nunneries, education initiatives, the purchasing of protective equipment and medical supplies, COVID relief, and much more. We also make sure that our donation fund supports a diverse range of religious and ethnic groups across the country. We invite you to visit our website to learn more about past projects as well as upcoming needs. You can give a general donation or earmark your contribution for a specific activity or project you would like to support. Perhaps even something you heard about in this very episode. All of this humanitarian aid work is carried out by our nonprofit mission, Better Burma. Any donation you give on our Insight Myanmar website is directed towards this fund. Alternatively, you can also visit the Better Burma website, betterburma.org. That's B-E-T-T-E-R-B-U-R-M-A dot org and donate directly there. In either case, your donation goes to the same cause and both websites accept credit cards. You can also give via PayPal by going to paypal.me slash betterburma. Additionally, we take donations through Patreon, Venmo, GoFundMe, and Cash App. Simply search Better Burma on each platform and you'll find our account. You can also visit either the Insight Myanmar or Better Burma websites for specific links to those respective accounts or email us at info at betterburma.org. If you'd like to give it another way, please contact us. Thank you so much for your kind consideration and support.